So our next speaker is Ravindra uh, Peravadi, coming from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and he's going to tell us about an automated approach to uh, do high throughput behavioral screening. Thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to uh, thank the uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity. I would also like to thank the U.S. Consulate for being uh, <laughs> gracious enough to give me my visa two hours before my flight last evening, <laughs> and United Airlines for getting me here two hours before uh, after having traveled uh, half the world. So, <laughs> wow. okay. so, so, so it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Um, <laughs> The next 10, 12 minutes, I'm not going to talk biology, okay? I'm going to introduce you to the realm of technology. So tickle your brains a little bit and see and show you some things that we developed in the lab and hopefully come up, you guys come up with applications on where we can you know, use these things. So this is uh, the work at the European Zebrafish uh, Resource Center uh, in Karlsruhe, Germany. And I'm going to present to you uh, automated approaches to sample handling and uh, high throughput behavioral screening of zebrafish. So the philosophy of the, of the European uh, Zebrafish Resource Center is to actually ask people like you, the biologists, for biological questions, and then develop based on certain technological expertises that we have in bioinformatics, in automated microscopy, in robotics, in chemistry, microfluidics, and so on, synergistically apply this and then solve your problems, okay? So the idea is to develop something that is completely automated and intelligent. Reduce manual intervention during your experiments, okay? And you concentrate on the biology and we do the technology for you. So essentially this is achieved through two important things. One is automation, one is intelligence. So what is intelligence? we do automated feature detection, okay? So all you need to do is to tell your system, or rather our systems, uh, what you're interested in looking at, okay? I'm, I'm interested in looking at the vision, um, or interested in looking at the brain or something like this, and we have atlases which automatically detect these features of interest without you having to move your microscope at all, okay? And these, the, the combination of this automation and this intelligence then gives you high throughput and high content uh, 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 screening platforms which then have minimal human, interven human intervention and then you have uh, a lot of uh, interesting data that comes out. So the approach is you have a biological question, we develop the assay for you. We, depending on the assay then we see if there is a need for a novel sample handling uh, system. We see if there is any need for con um, a novel imaging or whether we can use conventional imaging. One of the consequences of high throughput screening is that you have tons of data. In my lab, we generate seven terabytes of data per day, okay? So at the end of the year, so I'm looking at a couple of petabytes. So how do you handle this data and how do you actually analyze this data? So the first thing is, as I said, I mean, the zebrafish is a fantastic model. It uh, gives you a number of embryos every day, thousands of them actually, very amenable to screening. If you're doing one or two plates, it's beautiful, you can do it manually. What happens in cases like ours is we, we screen about 100 to 296 well plates per day, okay? And you can't manually pipette these embryos into these microtita plates. So what we developed first was, well, let's see, this works, good. So what we developed was an automated uh, embryo pipetting robot, which actually just, you, you, all you need to do is to put your embryos into a Petri dish, put it under the system, yeah? And the system detects whether the embryos are healthy, and if they are healthy, it pipettes them into your 96 well plate or a 384 well plate or into another Petri dish or any target uh, plate that you want, okay? Second thing is it works completely in darkness if you want to. There are many assays, example circadian rhythms and so on, where you don't want the embryos to be exposed to light, right? So this system can work completely in the dark and is very flexible, high throughput. We do one 96 well plate in 12 minutes, yeah? 
And I built this system for a total cost of 2,000 euros. So the next thing was, it's a slightly different take on the same thing, but most of the people nowadays do chemical screening in, in very large numbers, yeah? So you have a 100,000 uh, compound library and so on. And these compound libraries don't come cheap, okay? So one of the things is that when you, when you use a 96 well plate, you have a certain volume of the compound that you use up, and this is quite large. So one of the ways of overcoming this problem was to come up with a new plate, if you will, and what we call actually a fish microarray. So this is a structure that we created using super hydrophobic and super hydrophilic spots. Yeah? So you have a spot which is super hydrophilic, and the boundary of the spot is hydrophobic. Okay? So now you have a structure. You take a pipette with your embryos in it, and you just spread it over this plate, right? And then you have these, the, uh, the medium going only into these spots where it is super hydrophilic, and you have this inherent uh, uh, kind of separation that you see here, okay? The advantage with this is we use very, very minimal amount of the compound. We compared it with uh, we, we, uh, how, how the, the effect of the compound is using our structure in a classical 96 well plate. As you can see here, it performs exactly similarly. So now we have a structure where you use very reduced amount of volumes of the compound and is extremely high throughput because you don't have to pipe it, you just spread it over and then you're done. So this is for the sample handling. One of the things that we started to get recently interested in is behavioral phenotyping. A lot of people concentrate a lot on morphology. But when you look at complex problems like ecotoxicology or aquatic toxicology and things like this, where you have very low dosage exposure to compounds, okay, these don't show up morphologically, but they show up behaviorally. Okay? So what we did was we divided the early developmental stages of the zebrafish into, into three parts. Yeah? So the first one was the, the 30 hours to, to 40 hours, uh, where we do the photomotor response, which was uh, initially uh, discovered and presented by uh, Randy Peterson and Dave Kokel uh, a couple of years back. Then at the day three, we do touch response, and finally, when the lava are free swimming and self-feeding, we do vibration and locomotion. The photomotor response itself is uh, the response of the embryos to a flash of light, yeah, or to a pulse of light. And this is probably the earliest manifestation of behavior in, uh, in the embryos. And usually the embryos are moving normally. Then you give a pulse of light. They start to move very frantically. And then you wait for 10 seconds. You give another pulse of light. And they don't move anymore because they're still in the refractory phase. However, this entire process can be completely changed if the embryos are treated with neuroactive compounds, like, for example, what I show here is when they're treated with, for example, isoprotenerol or something like this, they move all the time. So this is one of the ways of being able to characterize your compound library or classify your compound library, if you will, into neuroactive compounds and non-neuroactive compounds. And this you can do at 30 hours post-fertilization. I mean, it can't get better than this. The next thing that we did was Vibration. So zebrafish embryos start to respond to vibration uh, once they are about three days to four days old. Okay? So we said so there are no conventional vibration systems that are available. And trust me, you can talk to any of these people who are going to present uh, this commercially, but they don't work. Okay? So we tried this a lot, and none of these systems uh, perform to, to what they claim. So what we did was we wanted to build a low-cost system. So we said, OK, fine. We take a small loudspeaker, which we buy for 20 bucks. Yeah? And then we hook this up with the back panel of an iPhone, which we bought on eBay for 2 euros. Okay? So this gives you the illumination. And now you have a system where you can feed in through your computer a, a particular signal. right? And the loudspeaker then responds to this. Of course, we have characterized this very, very, uh, 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 you can be very sure that it's actually 50 hertz and not, not something else. And then you have a Petri dish that sits on the top with embryos in them, and it's given the input. So this is how the system looks. 
And this is how the actual the vibration system. So, so you, you have embryos that are free swimming, and then after a couple of uh, uh, seconds, you have the, the, the pulse that is actually applied, which should come sometime now. And then they start to move, yeah? So the characteristic thing with vibration is that, and it has been uh, 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 very, very uh, uh, seriously studied, the embryos have a particular type of bending. So it's called C-bending, okay? So when, a, when, a, uh, when an input is given to, uh, or a pulse is given to these embryos, they bend in a particular manner. And this bending changes depending on the compound or depending on whether they're mutants, or it's a, you have a very, very different characteristic behavior, right? So we use this actually again as a secondary test after the photomotor response to characterize our compound library. And then to keeping up with our mantra of uh, high throughput, we developed a high throughput platform where we have a robotic system that actually does this continuously uh, over different uh, 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 s similar systems and then does it serially one after the other. We use latency as the phenotype here, that's a readout. So usually what, what happens is that if, if the fish is, uh, has a, a muscular failure or degeneration, then they have a very low latency, they react to, this, uh, to the pulse after uh, a long time. Normally they react uh, very, very fast, and this can be used as a, as a phenotype, and this is done uh, on the fly. The, so once the fish start free swimming, we developed another platform, which is a robotic imaging platform, which is actually a robotic arm, which has a high, resol high resolution camera. And each of these petri dishes there uh, has embryos in them, which are moving, right? And we do long-term tracking of these embryos. And we do feeding assays. So we give them paramecia and see how, how, uh, how long they take to consume these uh, uh, paramecia. We do a lot of, we have uh, transgenic lines which have uh, a certain set of uh, genes that are uh, knocked off, and then we test the effect of taste on them, and so on, right? So this is just to show you that we have a platform which can do absolutely long-term tracking of locomotion and feeding. Another interesting one that we developed recently was what we call a parallel imaging platform. So this is now a set of several cameras, so you don't have to go one, by, uh, one after the other. And this system then simultaneously looks at multiple plates, and then you get your data. I mean, so we, we can do, we usually use this to study circadian patterns, and we also use it for studying, for example, uh, heart, uh, uh, heartbeat detection and so on, right? So this is a shameless plugin. So we also work with uh, Loligo Systems uh, in Denmark, and they have a, uh, 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 a kind of an exhibition downstairs uh, in booth 701, where we uh, test preference behavior. So these are two chambers, and with a small channel that connects these two chambers, the two chambers have different types of chemicals or colors or two different inputs, and then we study whether how uh, uh, preference behavior and avoidance behavior based on this system. Finally, it's all very nice to have this data. What do you do with the data? So what we have developed, it's a, one of the uh, practical things that we realized in the lab was unless you analyze high throughput data almost immediately, it's of no use. Okay, so if you get six terabytes a day, and if you don't look at, look at it the very next day, I mean, you're not going to look at it ever again. So one of the things that we do is we do on-the-fly, real-time data analysis. So as the data comes in, you already have your algorithms that are running, and the next day you get your readouts. You have your raw data, you have your readouts. And we have a large-scale data facility sitting in Karlsruhe um, where we store all the information for, it's archived for 10 years along with the readouts and uh, you can access it from anywhere in the world. We also have real-time tracking and so pretty much the whole chain starting from the assay development to data handling exists in Karlsruhe. So if you have any interest in doing high throughput screening, contact me here. And uh, with this I would like to end and thank, uh, yeah, a lot of people. We have, time for, we have time for one question. Good. 
perfect. I have one. So your uh, robot that picks up the embryo, yeah. how how do you program it to detect the healthy embryo versus the normal? So when 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 I mean even if you look under uh, a normal light microscope, you know when they are coagulated, right? I mean they have a very white, cloudy mm -hmm. uh, background. So we use this as a feature, and then it can distinguish immediately between live embryos and coagulated embryos. I have a question, but we're going to wait for after the session. Yeah. Thank you again. Perfect, yeah.